I'd like to look with you picking up a number of themes that we've explored over the last day or so, thinking about fragments again, but seeing through fragments of violence and peace. Last night at the end of the dinner, I know many people had to go home or travel some distances, um, but just as people were leaving and the music was still going on, another group of people uh, joined us in the Rainy Hall, uh, led by Marla Trippick, who you may have heard of, um, is a survivor from Berger Belsen when she was there about 13 or 14. She was in a number of concentration camps and she was doing a talk in another room while we were having supper. There was over 100 people there. She was delighted to come and have supper and it was very humbling to actually listen to her and hear her, a little bit of her story. She did say, and I read this actually after I met because I went and checked up more about her when I went home actually last night. She described the moment of leaving the concentration camp, or being released from the concentration camp, particularly the comfort and care that she was offered as like moving out of hell into heaven, the clean sheets and the care of the liberating soldiers. When I thought about her story, I thought about a number of fragmented images, for example, at Yad Vashem in Western Jerusalem, such as these of people who were lost during the Shoah or killed during the Shoah. I then decided I should read something. So last night, I decided, read that. Well, no, I didn't read this. But I mean, I, I, I then proceeded to read, which I haven't read before, um, an amazing article, uh, essay by Duncan on the church and the concentration camp from reflections on the moral community. At the beginning of it, there's a thanks to Peter Heyman, Michael Northcott, and Margaret in terms of engagement. So you probably know this article better than I do because it was the first time I read it. But for me, this is quintessential Duncan. It's very rich, reflective, powerfully written, and describes how he takes his children um, on, holiday, on the way back from holiday in Austria. They drive past um, Dachau, and there's lots of questions about it in some detail about what's going on. Um, and he there reflects on it of outside uh, that makes him and Margaret uneasy is this 18th century church. And he, he wonders, he hypothesized what the church was doing, what people in the church were doing while the concentration camp was working. So he reflects on that very powerfully and then uses that as a way forward to engage in, in a way not dissimilar from how Jeremy was engaging with some practical theologians, it's sort of ecclesio ecclesiologically, particularly with Hauerwas. I don't want to go there, but I just want to observe that in terms of a, a theological method of how he's trying to, to work. We will perhaps return to that. But again, notice, notice how it's in, it, it's, it is a fragmentary style of doing theology, which is also quite inv invitatory. You are drawn into the story. And I was very struck listening to, to Teresa and to Heather as well, um, thinking about how they were using frag fragments. And I want to sort of respond to that um, as well. But before I think about fragmentary realities, I'd like to remind you of a well-known quote from Henry Thoreau. It's not what you look at that matters. Sorry, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. This is a very a rich quote, and I'm only beginning to learn more about Thoreau. Um, this is, you'll know, the, a, a reconstruction of the hut that he spent a little, some while in, writing in, experiencing nature. But look at this picture. When I looked at this picture again, it wasn't the person I was struck by, not the hut, but actually the trees. I'd like to, to stay with the trees and also to reflect on his, his essay of sauntering. Um, Duncan, I think I was probably one of Duncan's 50-something PhD students, and he was fantastic, as we've heard, of, of walking, but I never really thought Duncan was a saunterer. I mean, we would just sort of accelerate up the hill. It was very exciting. And it was like that sort of with theology. We sort of accelerate. There wasn't a lot of sauntering. Um, now, maybe that's being unfair. You, you, George, you may have other experiences of, of a sauntering Duncan. No, but, there's a, but perhaps I can encourage, and this is a challenge to myself as well, to perhaps saunter through thinking about different kinds of fragmented realities. Firstly, Duncan reflects on, and you, you'll remember this, on that the Gospels and even the Epistles do not present a system. Rather, they are full of parables, stories, epigrams, injunctions, songs, fragments, in short. And he builds a whole um, approach to theology. Uh, you'll remember the subtitle is, isn't it, it's an unsystematic theology. And he's clearly drawn, isn't he, to Bonhoeffer rather than to Bard. Um, so bearing that in mind, I'd like with you to think about four different kinds of fragmented realities. 
The first is fragmented landscapes. And listening to Michael today, I was both inspired and I suppose depressed, but also uh, liberated, particularly by the story of the, uh, of the children actually doing things. I was also reminded of this book, which I confess I haven't read yet, but I did. I thought I must read for this. You maybe know it, of the ecology of fragmented landscapes. The little bit I, I have encountered of it is striking how, how landscapes are cut. We cut through landscapes. For example, if you think about, she doesn't use Port Talbot, but Port Talbot was divided by a motorway going through it. I understand there were plans here in Edinburgh to build lots of dual carriageways through, through Edinburgh, cutting through different parts of Edinburgh. I think the only part that actually was built was the bit just near the McEwen Hall, but we were going to get large amounts of those roads. But it's interesting reflecting on the ecology of fragmented landscapes. But listening to Michael also made me think not only of this text, which I must read, but also of a number of First World War artists, particularly my favorite, Paul Nash. I don't know if you know Paul Nash's work, uh, ironically titled, We Are Making a New World. This was his response to what he saw as an official war artist. And uh, we could talk about Nash's art uh, all afternoon, famously the, the, the Menin Road. Just look at the trees, though. And let me encourage you just to look at the trees. There's so much to look at, but just look at the devastated trees, the natural order here, sh shattered. Or also the mule track. Again, look at the trees. They're almost, they're almost becoming like figures. One of the criticisms of Nash's art is sometimes he doesn't show bodies. There's no body here. And yet I've heard a number of art historians say, but wait a second, actually the bodies are here. They're in the landscape, because he was someone who saw many people who were disfigured, their faces were disfigured, and he reflected that in the landscape and the trees. Uh, again, notice the sun rising in this new world. What new world are we building together? So in Duncan's article on the church and the concentration camp, he takes us uh, from the concentration camp to, to World War I memorials. So briefly referencing a memorial such as this. To me, I do not find these, they do not invite me to participate uh, in, in remembering. I know some people it does happen, but for me, actually somebody like Otto Dix's work, uh, the, I'd like to use him as a counterpoint to a British artist, Nash, a German artist, responding to the First World War. The triptych, of course, a lot of people point out that a secular, um, a secular rendition of you have firstly a movement towards the passion here, you have a crucifixion in the middle. Again, watch the tree with this hand looking like a finger. And then finally, a, a weird sort of resurrection. Uh, so in terms of a, a, the, the war triptych, uh, thinking about. So that's, that's fragmented landscapes and how they're reflected artistically. Then I'd like to think going on from that about fragmented land. One of the striking aspects I've been finding out recently is about separation barriers. And over the last 12 years, there's something like 6,000 new miles of separation barriers. Just a quick reminder of some of the places you can find some of the older ones, such as in the 38th parallel, or this. I don't, know, don't think it's officially called Trump's border wall. Interesting artistic forms of resistance you'll find on it. Or we were hearing about, um, this is a, again, look at the barrier here. This is Melilla in, in, um, in Spanish Morocco. Or, of course, in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the so-called Peace Wall. This photograph has stayed with me for a long time, partly because I understand there's a tradition in some communities, the Protestant communities, of building fires where they throw all the things they don't like of the Catholics onto the fire. And then they put a very high Guy Fawkes, very high, so it can be seen the other side of the wall, and then set fire to it. But of course, how you build peace in this context, as we know, is, is difficult. It's fragmentary and building piece by piece by piece. Recently, as Eddie was saying, I've been involved in, in working in Jerusalem and Ramallah and um, Tel Aviv. One of the things that will always stay with me is going through this separation barrier, going through a number of checkpoints, and actually not meeting anybody, because everyone is in secure boxes in case I'm a suicide bomber. So it was quite a shock when I actually met a soldier the other side of the checkpoint, and was able to talk to him. Um, so this separation barrier uh, raises questions, of course. You can see it here. Maybe you could just work out the separation barrier. We could, again, do a whole lecture on this. Tracks all the way here. But notice that the separation is driven both by roads and by water, by hydropolitics, 
but also you'll see here, some people describe this as Swiss cheese in terms of the separate, separate settlements. So these are divided communities within the uh, Palestinian space. And then, of course, we reflect on this briefly at the opening on fragmented communities here in Edinburgh um, and actually slightly wider afield. This is, uh, if you remember, on the index of multiple deprivations. Because, of course, you don't need walls to separate communities. Duncan, this was something Duncan was passionate about. You'll perhaps remember in, on human worth, he argued that these kind of barriers, poverty would lead to weakening of social solidarity, the breakdown of justice systems, encourage competitive individualism, and widen social inequality. And he made these points, as we've heard, uh, passionately and well. And I'm very grateful to uh, each speaker uh, for highlighting that. Duncan, of course, was driven and motivated by many issues, public issues of the time. For example, uh, this, uh, in terms of apartheid, uh, this is one of our uh, photographic ex exhibitions based on the work of Ian Berry. And of course, in cities, it's possible to have all sorts of different barriers, and um, we could go on for that for some time. But perhaps I can move on to think about the implications of fragmented landscapes and fragmented land, because of course, they're fragmented lives. You can see that here in this one of my photogra favorite photographs um, from the, uh, uh, just when the wall was being built in Berlin. I think this is someone showing their uh, grandchildren to the grandparents. Or uh, you perhaps know this picture. This is uh, one of the, the most memorable rem uh, memorials from the First World War that I know. Um, and it's by Kathy Colwitz. And you perhaps know the story that Kathy or Katty Colwitz, she actually, what she did was, um, she was persuaded by her 18-year-old son to go to the father and say, look, let Peter fight. And uh, Peter's father said, who was against it initially, said, all right. And then within a few months, Peter was killed. Katty was one of the great artists of uh, uh, 20th century Germany, and she could not create a response to this. It took her the same number of years almost as Peter had lived, 18 years, to create this. This is um, in Belgium, and Peter's body is probably just over there uh, in terms of the distance. So you can see the shapes of, notice here how, uh, notice here that the differences here, uh, if you like, the separation, the barrier of grief, how grief there is separating both the parents, the father, and the mother. Again, though, I looked at this picture again, thinking about sauntering rather than rushing on from the picture. Notice how the natural order there is enclosing them and in some ways almost protecting them in their grief. Um, you maybe think I'm over-reading into that picture there. The tree of grief was a response to the Beslan uh, hostage uh, attack a few years ago where there were over 380 were killed. And again, you notice here that mothers are holding... Uh, if you like, pushing up the angels, their children, uh, towards heaven, the tree of grief. So those are fragmentary realities. I know that's very swift, and you may be thinking he's not sauntering, but I just want to offer those as fragmented landscapes, nations, <laughs> cities, and communities. Uh, Nick Adams, a friend and colleague here for many years, would often talk about reparative theology, repairing. It's interesting to think about how to repair fragmentary theology. You may think it doesn't need repairing. Some people uh, would argue that it does. Even internally, Duncan actually does some reparative work when he talks about fragmentary theology, because he talks about quarries as well. I'm increasingly aware that fragments detached from the quarry are particularly liable to be abused or misunderstood and distorted. So his emphasis is upon the importance of actually quarrying. That might be backstage work, but it might be engaging with the tradition in the biblical tradition or, in, uh, for example, in Augustine or Aquinas or so on. I'd like now to think reparatively, uh, briefly, in sort of balancing those fragmentary realities, to think about public theology as bearing witness. First, of course, textually. This was one of the quarries that Duncan would go back to again and again. Of course, this is a text... Uh, pertinent to think about barriers, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups um, one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Again, uh, tying in with um, what Joshua was saying in his response, thinking about the nature of dialogical public theology. 
And again, I, I'm struck by what Elaine was saying in the opening, uh, in her opening talk, thinking about the importance of dialogue. And in many ways, what we've been trying to do here is actually engaged in, in dialogue, in conversation. That's why I was delighted with the conversation in, in practical theology, in that it felt both intergenerational and international. Of course, thinking about how do we engage uh, with other traditions. So for example, I just uh, raised this as another example of dialogue. Uh, one of the first conferences I heard was in 1984 on the far right. We're returning to that issue. Some people say it's uh, in holding uh, a discussion in January of next year on responding to the rise of the far right with a number of different leading scholars to reflect on that. I invite you all to return uh, to this room. You'll be very welcome as we explore that together uh, dialogically and uh, reflectively and critically responding to the rise of the far right. Jonas can give more details if you need more. So thank you. Then, of course, there's reflective public theology. I, ne I originally titled this historical, but the reason I put reflective was I thought it was perhaps truer to what we've been doing uh, together in this room. But why I chose Hadrian's Wall is because, for me, it's symbolically very significant, because it's symbolic of the fact that walls don't last. Hadrian's Wall didn't last. In fact, Hadrian's Wall became an economic hub. Then, uh, again, tying him with your wonderful presentation last night, to think about Doug's, of uh, thinking about prophetic public theology. I was struck by and was wondering about acts of, of symbolic acts. That's why I enjoyed, Leslie, your response to the, to, you know, the symbolic acts of what, how, we, how we enact, how we embody uh, even things like lunch. Um, and Aruna, likewise, as well, in terms of the work in the World Council of Churches. But then, of course, there's imaginative public theology. And I suppose that's something I'm passionate about, how you imagine possible futures. This is about looking to the future. Uh, let me give a response here, which is an artist's response to separation barriers. One or two of you may have seen this before. It's by a friend filmmaker called Lucy Lyon. It's a very short clip. A wall represents a failure of politics. Um, you can't love your neighbor if you can't see them, if you can't talk to them. A lady who brings down walls um, is probably my most famous work. By putting an icon, something of incredible beauty, onto something which is itself so ugly, it's a way to challenge it and to break it. It's invoking the powers of heaven, the powers of reconciliation, the powers of love, into a chasm of despair and hopelessness. A lot of people just don't understand and, and feel frustrated at the inhumanity that they see, and they don't know what to do. So they come to this image and pray, and they just pray that somehow all these walls that people have built can, can crumble, can fade away, and something beautiful can be reborn. Bethlehem is the town of birth, of rebirth. And here it's the wall just positioned on the edge of Bethlehem and the edge of Jerusalem. So it's this, this sort of transition point where you've got all this despair but then also this hope breaking through. So there we are, public theology as bearing witness, as dialogical, reflective, prophetic, imaginative, doxological, uh, to reflect also in, uh, and Glenn's developmental reflections on the nature of public theology. But of course, it's deeply political and also extremely practical. So by way of conclusion, this is one of my favorite pictures from the Botanic Gardens. Again, notice the trees. I'm very struck by, of course, frames both bring us into a point, but also leave things out. Uh, things are left outside. And it's interesting to think about what's been left outside the conversation here, both in my presentation and all of ours. But of course, where you are sitting changes how you see through a frame. Each of us bring, as we know, different frames of reference.
So this will change how we look at something like this, the Tree of Life. You'll remember from Mozambique, where lots of weapons were brought and put into a tree to create something new. Or this, and this is the last picture, a Tree of Hope uh, by Mark Carruth. This is in Jerusalem. And this, he, he, he wants to create something for a hospital, an eye hospital. And he created the Tree of Hope because he, he know, knew that many olive trees were destroyed. But then he also wanted to put something on it that, sh that showed, embodied, going beyond, <laughs> beyond barriers. And of course, something that goes beyond barriers, something which is not held by air birds. So you can see that here, you can just notice that the swallows that are something which are hopeful in terms of being able to go beyond. Some people have described this a resurrection image because of the hope rooted in it. And I think the resurrection is probably a good place to stop. So thank you. Thank you.